Chair, Professor Nic Caroline Nicholson, members of the executive of the University of Pretoria, our speaker this evening, Deputy Dean of Teaching and Learning, Professor Human Fuhrl, head of, heads of departments present here, and in particular, head of department of education psychology, the home academic department for Professor Human Fuhrl, um, in the name of Professor Ruth Mampani, family of Professor Human Fuhrl, distinguished guests, staff and students, ladies and gentlemen. It is my honor to welcome you to this inaugural address this evening to be presented by Professor Human Fuhrl. We are privileged to have Professor Caroline Nicholson, the registrar at the University of Pretoria to officiate over this inaugural address this evening. I will now introduce Professor Nicholson. Professor Nicholson completed a BPROC and LLB degrees at the University of the Wettfahrtersrand and served her articles at flagship with a general law firm, Chenins, which is located in Hyde Park, Corner, Johannesburg. During her articles, she completed both the attorney's admission and notary public examinations and was admitted as a practicing attorney and notary public. Not long after completing her studies, Prof. Nicholson took up an academic appointment at the University of South Africa. She remained at UNISA for 12 years, during which time she progressed from lecturer to senior lecturer, teaching modules in the introduction to South African law, legal philosophy, private international law, and comparative law. She was also a founding contributor to the Diploma in Gender Law. During a stay at UNISA, Prof. Nicholson completed his research master's in law in the field of banking law and a doctor of laws in comparative conflict of law focused on the topic international parental child abduction. In 1999, Prof. Nicholson moved to the University of Pretoria where she remained for 15 years. During her time at UP, Faculty of Law, Prof. Nicholson progressed from senior lecturer to associate professor and then professor. She completed training as a family mediator and did some outside work in the field. She also completed an, the Arbitration Foundation of Southern Africa Postgraduate Diploma in Alternative Dispute Resolution with distinction. Professor Nicholson taught variously in Roman law, comparative law, Introduction to Law, Jurisprudence 101, and in the master's module on research methodology. She also served a four-year term as the first female head of department in the Faculty of Law at UP. In 2014, Prof. Nicholson was offered the position of Dean of Law at the University of the Free State in Bloemfontein. She was the first ever female Dean of an academic faculty at, U at the UFS. As Dean of Law at UFS, Prof. Nicholson was a co-founder of the Free State Center for Human Rights. She was also instrumental in having a postgraduate program in alternative dispute resolution introduced and launched in the faculty, and together with alternative dispute, my apologies, she was also instrumental in having a postgraduate program in alternative dispute resolution introduced and launched in the faculty, and together with faculty staff, road mapped a transformed LLB curriculum for implementation in 2020. She also served two terms as an acting judge in the High Court during her tenure at UFS. Professor Nicholson returned to the University of Pretoria as registrar in January 2018. In this role, she's responsible for information governance, the Secretariat, strategic risk management, internal audit and compliance services, UP archives, UP museums, and the Javed UP Art Center. She's further responsible for the Department of Enrollment and Student Administration and Legal Services. Professor Nicholson has served on the executive of international bodies and on the, on the auditorial boards of several legal journals and has presented at numerous local, national, and international conferences, and has published articles on a variety of topics. Ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together as we welcome 
the registrar to the podium. Evening, everybody. Um, less you're wondering why I got such a lengthy biography on me. Uh, it's so that uh, Professor Yuman Fuchel doesn't feel cheated by not having the VC here this evening to do this himself. He was unavoidably uh, detained this evening. Uh, so I'm not wearing my registrar's hat this evening. I'm actually acting on behalf of the, the Vice Chancellor here this evening. If you look around you, you'll see quite a small in-person audience. That's not a reflection on Professor Human Fuchel because this uh, session is also being live streamed. So there is another audience which you can't actually see. Uh, but um, I'd like to welcome you all here this evening. Thank you uh, to the Dean of the Faculty. Welcome to the various deans, deputy deans, heads of department that are here this evening. Um, and a particular word of welcome to uh, the following members of Professor Yuman Fuchel's family who are in the auditorium as well as a few who are in the online session. So first of all, I'd like to welcome uh, Mr. Rurik Fuchel, um, Sir Luemi's husband. I'd like to welcome her daughter, Ray. You're very welcome here this evening. Um, in addition, uh, Mr. Frick Human, uh, Salome's father, who's joined us online, and his wife, Jenny. And then also from, uh, I'd like to welcome Professor Cecilia Bauer, who is uh, Professor Human Fuchel's mentor, and her netball coach from school, Rina Payne. I'm sure that the significance of that will become apparent at some point uh, during this evening's proceedings. So it's my very great pleasure this evening to introduce to you to present our inaugural lecture, Professor Sir Luemi Human Fuchel, who I've had the privilege of knowing for a number of years now. Um, Professor Human Fuchel has a BA and a BA honors in psychology. She has a Bachelor of Education honors in educational psychology, a Master of Education Honor, uh, a Master of Education in Educational Psychology with Distinction and a PhD in Educational Psychology. And she is a professor in, yes, you guessed it, Educational Psychology. She's also the Deputy Dean Teaching and Learning for the faculty and she's currently serving her second term in that role. Uh, professor Human Fuchel, um, has been a registered educational psychologist for more than two decades and has served on professional bodies or on the professional board of psychology from 2017 to 2020 and she regularly acts as a convener of professional board examinations and professional accreditation visits for the board of psychology. Professor Human Fuchel also served as a council um, member of the South African Council of Educators from 2018 to 2021. Professor Human Fuchel was a C-rated researcher at the time that she accepted her position in the faculty as Deputy Dean, and she's delivered numerous masters and doctoral students um, in um, educational psychology, and she publishes regularly in both national and international journals. Her research interests focus on meaningful academic commitment as a self-regulatory process and its implications for student success while her professional and teaching interests and experience focuses on family psychology and counseling. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's wonderful that you've all chosen to be here this evening to celebrate Pro Professor Human Fuchel's uh, position as a professor in this institution. This is a very meaningful occasion for every professor and I think it is in equal parts an evening full of excitement as well as one full of terror. So I trust that Professor Human Fuchel is going to enjoy every minute of the opportunity that she has to address you this evening. So I now present Professor Human Fuchel to deliver her inaugural address entitled, Why Do You Persist, Mr. Anderson? Thank you. I think I'm going to wait with the water. 
<clears throat> Professor Nicholson, uh, Professor Sehule and Professor Mampane, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. And thank you for taking time out of your evening to join me uh, in celebrating this academic ritual. And I wish to thank not only you for coming this evening, but also the university uh, for placing the trust in me um, in, in terms of this promotion and being able to address you tonight on, on my work. Before I begin, I want to heed the advice of Seneca, the Stoic philosopher, and acknowledge the many colleagues, some of whom are here tonight, who in some way or another guided, influenced or inspired me, and therefore contributed to bringing me to this point in my academic career. I feel very fortunate that some of them are here tonight, and I would like to acknowledge each of them separately. First of all, to my husband, soulmate and co-author, Rurik, thank you for your unwavering support and commitment through the years. You are my North Star. To my daughter, Ray, I truly stand in awe of your intelligence, your courage, and your resilience. I'm so grateful that I have the privilege of witnessing the life that you are carving out for yourself. Frau Lina, the genuine love and care and dedication you showed all of us, your kinners, your girls, who passed through your hands, whether in your class or on the netball field, will remain unsurpassed. To me, you are the embodiment of commitment. Cecilia, Prof. Bauer, you have inspired excellence in all of your students. I am proud to be associated with you, and I count myself fortunate to have been in your company for some of the most important parts of my academic journey. To my father, who cannot be here tonight, he taught me that there's nothing I cannot do just because I'm a woman. It is because of him that I have this enduring belief that I can do anything that I set my mind to. And lastly, my dean, Professor Sahuli, you stepped into my life at a time when I questioned my commitment to academia <clears throat> and whether I belong. You saw something in me that I could not see at the time, and that is why I'm here tonight. As might be evident from the title of my address, tonight I will consider the role of meaning as a driver of academic commitment. I believe that most of us here tonight have personal experience of commitment <clears throat> and how our commitments can shape our priorities as we invest ourselves in taking actions that over time reveal us to ourselves and to those around us. The primary hypothesis that I advance in my work is that the capacity for meaningful commitment arises from the sense of coherence we experience when our actions are aligned with our sense of self and when our immediate environment enables us to express who we are. In a scene of Matrix Revolutions, the third movie in the popular Matrix series, the protagonist, whom we get to know as Neo, is involved in a final battle with Agent Smith, an artificial intelligence program, who had infected the entire virtual Matrix world by replicating himself like a virus. In a fit of rage, Agent Smith asks Neo, why keep fighting? You believe you're fighting for something, for more than your survival? Can you tell me what it is? Do you even know? Is it freedom or truth or perhaps peace? Could it be for love? Illusions, Mr. Anderson, vagaries of perception, temporary constructs of a feeble human intellect trying desperately to justify an existence that is without meaning or purpose all of them as artificial as the matrix itself. You can't win, it's pointless 
to keep fighting. Why, Mr. Anderson, why? Why do you persist? And Neo's answer, because I choose to. He then proceeds to sacrifice his matrix persona, known as Thomas Anderson, by allowing Agent Smith to infect and delete him from the matrix, along with all existing copies of Agent Smith. Now, Agent Smith, an artificial intelligence program, clearly does not appreciate the human qualities of choice, purpose, and meaningfulness. How could he? Arguably, as an AI, his program does not enable self-understanding to construct personal meaning or to define a life purpose. As of yet, an AI cannot be aware of itself and thus cannot make meaning of its own existence. Neo, on the other hand, having awakened from the matrix to discover his human nature, in so doing discovers his purpose, which is to free other human beings from the matrix created by machines. A sense of purpose is often associated with meaning because it creates a feeling that one's behavior is guided by goals that are personally valued. Neo's sense of identity becomes invested in a purpose that provides meaning to his existence. He understands what he is meant to do with his life. He realizes he can choose and act in accordance with this newfound sense of purpose, something which Agent Smith clearly finds as perplexing as he finds it frustrating. Importantly, having awoken to the realization that he's human, Neo realizes he has the power to choose. The meaning that arises from being able to choose is what sustains him and allows him to persist against all odds. Mr. Anderson is all of us. He finds expression in you and I and the many students sitting in our classrooms. For many of us, Life can be like a virtual matrix in which we play out roles ascribed to us, often without a clear sense of purpose and never fully realizing how a lack of autonomy and purposeful choice robs us of meaning. So much of our lives and the lives of our students unfold like a script with little apparent meaning and from which there appears to be no escape. Get up in the morning, go to class, Go to work, do the things you do at work, go home, do more work, complete an assignment, make dinner, have dinner, try to get some rest, get up early to be ready for the next day, attend the meeting your boss asked you to, stress because you don't have time to catch up on email. You're a student, log on to ClickUp, read the chapter for the next class, an announcement wants you to submit questions to prepare for class, do that, but feel unprepared because there was no feedback. It's time for class, attend it. There's a surprise quiz, do that. Fail, because there was too much to read and too little time. Feel like a failure, skip the next class because who cares? So many decisions and actions, but the question is, what meaning, if at all, do any of it have? Research suggests that if we feel that our actions do not have any personal significance, we tend to experience a loss of meaning. In a review of the construct of meaning in life, King and Hicks pointed out a well-established finding that true self-knowledge predicts meaning in life over and above many other covariates. In my own work over several studies, meaning provided additional predictive power explaining investments and level of commitment. This means that students who feel their academic pursuits have personal meaning will put in more consistent effort without being compelled to do so. This is because they know themselves well enough to understand their personal aspirations and its relevance to their life goals and future. And as a result, they consciously choose to be engaged and their studies become a vehicle for personally meaningful expression of their identity. These are the students who have woken up from the matrix to discover their purpose and then act accordingly. Initially, my work on academic commitment as a variable of interest in academic success focused on exploring how students' mental models 
reflect the assumed relationships between positive mood constructs and goal-directed behavior. I wanted to understand how students coped with situations that require self-regulation and what role, if any, positive mood might play in such evaluations. This question was asked against a framework in which I conceptualized self-regulation and commitment in terms of four levels at which goals can be pursued, namely at the level of the self, achievement, task, and cognitive levels. At the level of the self, goal pursuit tends to be identity relevant and conscious, while at the lower levels, goals are more immediate and automatic, such as regulating attention during a routine tasks. At the lower levels, aspirations function more like intention than commitment. For example, a student may intend to complete a task, such, an such as an assignment, or may formulate a goal of achieving a distinction on a test. But the intention to complete tasks or to achieve are not yet evidence of commitment. For commitment to be meaningful, it must be located at the level of the self. Commitments related to the level of the self impose constraints on the actions that are available to one at the lower levels. Consequently, they determine the choices available to us about the tasks and achievements we want to invest ourselves in to meet our commitments. A participant in one of my first studies on the topic put it in this way. My commitment to things stretches far beyond the academic world. I am more. I'm more than my deeds. And those points in time where I have questioned the commitments that I've made, changed the commitments that I've made, which is not something I do very lightly, have been very gr big growth points in terms of who I am as a person. We become known by our commitments. We define ourselves through our commitments, which then shapes our actions. Commitments become a vehicle for self-expression, and as such, commitments reflect a moral obligation to act consistently in accordance with oneself. The Stoic philosopher Epictetus said, first decide who you would be, then do what you have to do. This is what I term identity-relevant regulation. There's a rich tradition of work that considers behavioral and task investments under the construct of student engagement. And it is often considered to be one of the most decisive factors in student success. Curiously though, the field of student engagement remains preoccupied primarily with actions at the cognitive, task and achievement levels of our hierarchical model. My own work suggests that student engagement in the absence of identity level commitment is not enough to sustain the long-term persistence required for academic success. Rather, my findings suggest that identity level commitments can add significant additional value to how we understand the kind of interventions we require to impact positively on student success. In her book, Mindset, The New Psychology of Success in 2007, Carol Dweck discusses how the mindsets people have contain beliefs about themselves that have the potential to impact on their success. Mindsets or mental models reflect a network of personal beliefs that impact on people's goal hierarchies, goal selection and goal pursuit. This simply means that we tend to value goals that reflect our personal sense of self and our pursuit of those goals become meaningful because they allow us to express our identity. On the slide you see an example of a mental model that depicts how a sample of South African students in this study thought about the causal relationship between positive mood and self-regulation. It indicates how they constructed self-regulation as an outcome in a network of beliefs that shows how the self and the future can impact on their self-efficacy and motivation. 
Studies of student engagement typically conceptualize self-regulation as an input or process variable rather than an outcome variable. Students' mental models in my research suggested that experiencing positive mood and psychological well-being was important to develop feelings of self-efficacy, and that self-efficacy influenced whether students thought they could reach their goals in the future, and this impacted how they regulated their behavior. For the students in our classrooms, it means this. If the learning environment we create for our students is fraught with negativity, anxiety, judgment, and low expectations, our students will simply be too afraid to learn. It is a well-established fact that neither humans nor animals can learn when they feel threatened. They will not develop confidence in themselves or develop a hopeful future perspective. Students will feel incapable and unmotivated in their studies, in avoid interacting with lecturers, and will not set any learning goals for themselves, nor strive to attain them. Since the hope of passing the module in future will be diminishing by the minute, many students' behaviors become externally regulated or even dysregulated. And this simply means that they will either withdraw completely or merely comply with external requirements such as class attendance and assessment, but they will not take personal responsibility for their own success. The relationship between positive mood and self-regulation was further supported in a sample of Flemish students in two different school systems in Antwerp in Belgium. In both these studies, the relationship between students' present and future self formed the basis for developing a theory of meaningful academic commitment to assist in explaining why, despite knowing the importance of goal setting, students often do not set goals or regulate their behavior to attain future goals. Recently, King and Hicks in 2021 confirmed that goals, a future-oriented construct that requires imagining oneself in the future, reaching a goal, is linked to meaning in life. I have argued that academic commitment is a teleological construct because future goals align with one's future self. Future goals reflect who we aspire to be in future. It follows that students who do not know what they aspire to cannot be capable of meaningful commitment. And so it is at least partially incumbent upon us to think about how we might support students to develop their future aspirations. Many of us here this evening certainly aspire to be effective teachers or lecturers and to make a meaningful contribution to our students' lives through our teaching. But we might also find that despite our best efforts, students do not necessarily participate meaningfully in our lectures. Why? If we are creating a positive learning environment for our students and prompting the need for self-regulatory behaviors in our teaching, why do some students still not engage sufficiently by investing the necessary time and effort into their studies? Why do they have to be forced to come to class with surprise tests and in-class assessments? Why are they not in our classes because they want to be there? What distinguishes those students who, despite much adversity, persist in the pursuit of their goals to complete their degree from those who don't? As you might suspect, I will argue that the reason has to do with the experience of personal meaning or the lack thereof. Let us briefly consider how commitment is typically conceptualized in settings outside of an academic environment. In organizational settings, commitment is often described as having an effective, normative, or a continuance component. Employees are committed to the organization when they are happy and they feel an effective bond with the organization, experience loyalty, or feel obligated to stay and think that they have too much to lose if they leave. 
in romantic contexts, the well-known investment model of commitment describes level of commitment as the decision to persist with a relationship. It is predicted by the experience of satisfaction. In the relationship, strengths of investments made, as well as a lack of quality of alternatives. This model suggests that we remain committed to our partners when we experience satisfaction, feel that we have invested much into the relationship, and when we don't perceive the existence of better alternatives to our current relationship. If we extend this model to an academic setting, academic commitment should occur when students experience satisfaction, which would be effective commitment, have invested a great deal of time and effort, continuous commitment, and do not have any quality of alternatives. From an organizational perspective, we could add that students are also likely to remain committed due to obligation, such as meeting family or societal expectations, which would be normative commitment. This seems like a reasonable candidate model for academic commitment, and it is, in fact, since many of these assumptions inform most academic success initiatives that employ strategies to maximize student satisfaction and to foster greater engagement. And these efforts are certainly not in vain, since they do achieve some success. Students do better when they spend more time and effort on their studies, and there's a burgeoning literature to support that observation. However, at the heart of my work on academic commitment, which these studies do not address, is the following question. What makes students choose to spend more time and put in greater effort when it is not demanded of them? Is there a difference between students who attend class because they want to be there versus those who are in class because attendance will be taken? I think there is. Merely considering the relevance of intrinsic and extrinsic motivation tells us so. When we nudge and prompt students to engage with learning content on the institutional learning management system, of course they will show greater behavioral engagement. And it can impact positively on their academic performance. But it is still merely evidence of external regulation of learning. At best, it is indicative of interjected or identified regulation, but it is still extrinsic. It is not true intrinsic motivation, and I would add that it is most certainly not internally regulated learning. And intuitively, it does not sound like commitment. Commitment is about choosing to persist, like Mr. Anderson, even when on the face of it, one has every reason to give up. So it is about personal choice, personal choices that we make that come from within us more than the external environment demanding compliance that reflects commitment. Reflecting on the nature of commitment, a student told me the following, blind loyalty is a dangerous thing. There has to come a point where you have to question, if necessary, despite commitment and effort, to change your course of action. And here was an interesting point being raised. When is persistence the result of commitment? When does it reflect mere compliance? And when does it reflect loyalty? Like commitment, compliance and loyalty suggest some kind of obligation to act in a certain way that might not reflect an autonomous choice. If the ability to choose is central to meaningful commitment, then I felt I needed to understand the essence of each of these constructs and our relationship, uh, their relationship to our sense of self. To work out this fundamental difference between obligation, compliance and loyalty on the one hand, and personal meaning and choice on the other, I look to an unlikely source of inspiration. My beloved and loyal dog of 15 years, Bella, a golden cocker spaniel. 
Dogs are often described as loyal. You may be familiar with the saying, I work for money if you want loyalty, get a dog. I have never heard of a dog being described as being committed. It is not uncommon for psychologists to consider models of human behavior as a means for understanding human behavior. And so looking at Bella one afternoon, I tried to answer this question. Are dogs capable of being committed? What is the difference between loyalty and commitment? Does her behavior reflect compliance or commitment? It is undeniable that humans and dogs form effective bonds, but we also know that dogs will be loyal to anyone who can meet their needs and treat them well. Their pack mentality makes them loyal to their owner, sadly even to their de detriment. This is why they are considered loyal. So perhaps what we normally describe as commitment to an organization or a person can be better described as loyalty. If so, it might sound something like this. Well, I've been with this person or organization for so long. I've put so much time into it or them. There isn't really anything else that looks much better. And I'm satisfied, all things considered, so I guess I'll stick around. In an academic context, the equivalent would be our students saying, well, I'm at varsity now, and student life is great, but considering there are no jobs to be had if one does not have a degree, plus someone is spending a lot of money for me to have this opportunity, I'll just push through until I'm done, no matter how boring it is. And if Bella were capable of expressing her thought processes, it would probably be, I'll stick close to this human because as long as I do, I will survive. None of this sounds very committed to me. What Bella helped me to realize is that commitment happens only when our choices reflect our sense of self and become meaningful to us as a result so that we feel there's a greater purpose and meaning to what we do. Dogs cannot really be committed because, like Agent Smith, they do not have a sense of self that can guide their goal selection or impact on their life choices. Yes, they are loyal because they do have an instinct for survival and a pack mentality that allows them to recognize what to do to survive. This is what baffled Agent Smith in The Matrix, because if you have no ch chance of survival, why persist? Mr. Anderson in our class might say, none of the stuff I have to learn makes any sense, so why put in the effort? Let me just focus on passing the tests. In a committed relationship, subject to the usual ups and downs of life, our commitment reflects our choice to remain in a relationship despite bad times and many hardships, and especially when there may be quality alternatives available. Because we invest so much of ourselves in a relationship, it becomes a reflection of who we are, a vehicle to self-expression, and this self-expression is what gives us purpose and gives our commitment meaning. This is why disengagement from a long-term commitment can feel like we are losing a part of ourselves because actually we are. Recall the student who said, those points in time where I have questioned the commitments that I have made have been very big growth points in terms of who I am as a person. The meaning we derive from pursuing commitments has the power to sustain us in hard times when it might feel like we would rather be doing something else. Personal meaning is what sustained Neo in fighting Agent Smith. It is also what prevented Agent Smith from understanding why Neo persisted with seemingly impossible odds stacked against him. So, Academic commitment requires investing ourselves in our academic goals and being able to express who we are through our studies to be considered meaningful. This means that Mr. Anderson, sitting in your class, must not only engage with your subject by investing his time and effort, but by investing himself. How do we accomplish that? To do so, 
the subject must be perceived as relevant to his personal goals. Investing oneself means to select future identity relevant goals, that is, goals that reflect who we see ourselves becoming in the future, so that the time and effort we put into achieving our future goals now becomes part of who we aspire to be in the future. When this happens, students' goals will not merely be to pass tests and obtain a degree to get a job, but rather to pursue their future self by selecting these identity-relevant goals and pursuing them with dedication and persistence. Of course, this means that students must know themselves to a degree that they know who they are and what they value. My co-researchers and I tested these hypotheses in several studies using the academic commitment scale, an instrument measuring a modified version of the investment model of commitment. We tested the assumption that meaning arises from a personal sense of self and we found that self-differentiation described as the perception of the self as autonomous predicted students' level of commitment in addition to satisfaction. This means that students who have a well-defined sense of self are better equipped to form meaningful academic commitments because they are likely to select goals that are identity relevant. We found that engineering students demonstrated high levels of commitment to their studies if they derived satisfaction from it, but even more so if they had high levels of self-differentiation. In other words, when students perceive themselves as autonomous and capable of making choices, they tend to know themselves better and are more committed to their studies. Autonomy refers to choicefulness, an important construct in self-determination theory that describes how satisfaction of three basic psychological needs of autonomy, competence, and relatedness impact on intrinsic motivation. One of my doctoral students, Dr. Jean Meyring, who was co-supervised by Dr. Christopher Niemick at the University of Rochester, New York, found support for her hypothesis that identity-related commitment plays an important role in intrinsic motivation. Her study indicated that meaningful commitment was significantly related to perceived competence and autonomous motivation. Interestingly, meaningful commitment predicted autonomous motivation more strongly than need support, suggesting that meaningfulness could possibly be a fourth basic psychological need in addition to the three basic psychological needs for autonomy, competence, and relatedness. More recently, my co-author and I, Vogel and Himan Vogel, found further evidence supporting the impact of identity involvement on academic commitment in second-year engineering students. The results indicated that students with a diffuse avoidant identity style, this is an identity style that is associated with reactivity and procrastination, and little self-knowledge, those students showed a significant negative correlation to academic commitment, and it also predicted a lack of engineering identity, meaningfulness, and satisfaction. On the other hand, a normative identity style predicted engineering identity and meaningfulness, but not satisfaction. These findings were taken as evidence of the more enduring impact that identity investments can have as a pathway to meaningful commitment that could possibly sustain commitment in the absence of satisfaction. Essentially what this means is that meaningful commitments help students to persist when they feel like giving up. It is what drove Neo to, Neo to persist despite much hardship. Meaningful commitment is what brings students to class when lectures might be the very reason they would much prefer to be somewhere else. The question that remains for the future, though, is what kind of learning environment is likely to enable 
the development of meaningful academic commitment. Unlike the illusory but deterministic and one-dimensional virtual existence characteristic of the matrix world, our students live in a unpredictable and complex world that requires them to formulate personal life goals and to choose how they will reach those goals. As Neo discovered, such a complex world demands that we know who we are and what we value if we want to live a meaningful and purposeful life. Once we discover what is personally meaningful to us, a learning environment that insists on little more than superficial compliance with endless requirements, tasks, and external regulation of our behavior, while limiting our ability to choose, becomes demotivating and meaningless. Drawing on another example of animal behavior will illustrate, shockingly perhaps, how the learning environment we create for students can work against us to foster compliance and a lack of autonomy in students, rather than personal development and academic commitment. The picture you see there is Galileo, a confident, 12-year-old Frisian horse with a dominant personality. Like many of the students we know, Galileo wants to cooperate and please. He complies with reasonable requests, provided he understands what is asked of him. He is not permitted to show initiative, so learning to receive clear instructions and to comply with them calmly and unquestioningly is very important for his training to be considered successful. In fact, successful training is measured by Galileo's compliance with the trainer's instructions and his ability to carry out instructions correctly and according to set expectations while meeting a specific standard, much like the formative assessments we give our students. The trainer determines what behavior is acceptable those who know horses will know that if given the choice, horses would prefer to be left to their own devices rather than comply with our instructions. So to train them, we have no choice but to restrict their freedom. At this point, you might agree with me that we compel performance also in our students, just as we do with horses by applying pressure providing rewards, or by controlling their movements or restricting their freedom. We control horses with a bridle and a lead rope. We control students by taking class attendance and doing in-class assessments. If the control was not there, it's very likely that neither the horse nor the student would be there either. We control what is taught, determine what is learned, decide what is assessed, and we expect nothing less than compliance. Academic commitment can never flourish in a learning environment where students' autonomy is diminished and where compliance is rewarded. What then should a learning environment that enables meaningful commitment look like? I first addressed this question in my doctoral study many years ago. And I still insist that the learning environments we create must reflect the complexity of the world we live in if we want to mediate the development of complex cognition and self-regulation required for academic success. Coming to terms with the complexity on a cognitive level requires us to impose ourselves on our environment and to make sense of it, to create structure and to learn to shape it and master it. Complex learning environments pose many more challenges and opportunities for self-regulation than overly simplified or structured environments do because students must accomplish several personal, interpersonal and academic goals simultaneously. It is in a complex learning environment where students best get to know themselves formulate personally meaningful goals, and learn how to pursue these goals through investing in committed action. Unfortunately, education systems worldwide 
have leaned more towards a mechanistic, simplified and predictable version of reality, a kind of matrix as it were, in which learners' paths are programmed to uniformly progress through phases according to their age cohorts. They learn the same things in highly structured environments and their sheer number makes anything other than passive learning highly unlikely. In this system, the outcome is success or failure. Often, the only choice we have is to accept that there is no choice to be had at all. And success requires that one must simply endorse externally expo imposed expectations through compliance with the requirements of the script. Most of us have not yet awakened from this matrix, which like our education system, requires more compliance and provides few opportunities for autonomy and making personally meaningful choices. How then can we design learning environments that encourage meaningful academic commitment and that supports persistence and leads to academic success? What kind of teaching is required in our complex world to enable students to persist with their academic commitments. I argue that future research must question the applicability of the outdated pedagogical and didactic models that underpin our course design and teaching practices and the extent to which they enable academic commitment. Our commitment to improving student learning must simply trump any loyalties we may have to existing teaching practices simply because they are all we have. Our teaching practices cannot continue to encourage students' passive compliance with externally imposed goals. It represents the antithesis of commitment and will never foster meaningful academic commitment, meaningful engagement and self-regulation. Compliance with external goals can become commitments if we make learning meaningful relevant and give students choices about what they learn and we must find ways of doing this when we teach. A meta-analysis of 225 studies published by Freeman and colleagues in 2014 in the highly cited multidisciplinary proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences indicate that students in undergraduate STEM classes with traditional lecturing were one and a half times more likely to fail than classes that emphasize constructivist learning, including group problem solving and tutorials. And also the examination scores, those students in the constructivist classes, improved by 6%. The authors recommended that future research must focus on using advances in educational psychology and cognitive science to inform our course design to understand which types of active learning is most appropriate for certain students and disciplines, and also what instructor behaviors make active learning more effective. I have described in my own research how students' mental models impact on their self-regulation through the beliefs they hold about self-regulation and about instruction as well as the lecturer. Now, future research must connect these insights so that we can understand how to design a learning environment that enables us to foster such beliefs in students. How we design our courses must, at a minimum, consider how teaching will support students' personal competency, create opportunities for motivated engagement that can lead to self-regulated learning and goal-directed behavior. One student in one of my studies said to me the following, I think values determine what you commit to, what course of action you decide to possibly take. I want to make a difference. To me, that is important. I don't want to do something that does not make a difference. I knew I had to study to actually make a difference. Because of my value of wanting to make a difference, I do think there's a responsibility as a researcher to bring about change. Because students' self-knowledge and identity style impact on commitment, 
the meaning they draw from their studies, and the likelihood that they will persist with their studies, it stands to reason that if our teaching can provide students opportunities to explore who they are, reflect on what they value, and connect the learning content to their future aspirations, they will be more likely to experience our teaching as meaningful, and they will be more likely to persist with their studies to completion. My research has also indicated that students value opportunities for social interaction and that active student participation is important for promoting academic success and engagement with learning content. Therefore, course design should explicitly address how we will provide opportunities for meaningful interactions with peers, in addition to the interactions with lecturers. Designing courses clearly calls for a consideration of much more than merely teaching ex cathedra, but calls for a more complex conceptualization of teaching and learning in which we take to heart that students are not only in our classes to master a subject, but essentially to master themselves. After all, as one student said, Studying and academics took a long time, and it was a certain way of doing it which had its shortcomings. But I knew it would be worthwhile in the end because it would help me grow as a person and get further towards where I want to be. Adding to the argument that constructivist learning environments can enable active learning and lead to personal mastery, Cal Yuga and Singh in 2015 in Educational Psychology Review make the case that complex learning environments, such as those involving project-based or inquiry-based learning, must abandon the established rule in cognitive load theory that novice learners need comprehensive prior instruction, explicit instruction, before they can learn on their own. They go on to explain that studies of cognitive load theory never considered anything more than highly structured, simple problem-solving tasks. Its principles are not universally applicable to the authentic, complex and diverse world that students live in. Structured learning environments, as we have seen, foster compliance, passivity, together with a propensity to focus on knowledge acquisition only, and this hardly provides space for self-discovery and meaningful commitment. Very few students emerge from a one-hour lecture feeling that their lives have been meaningfully enriched, particularly if they struggle to see its relevance to their lives. Future research should therefore interrogate how we can foster personal meaning by ensuring that teaching and learning is real world relevant. One way to do this would be to focus on developing real world competencies. Competency-based education focuses on holistic development and ensures that students are prepared to meet the demands of the real world. We are living in a time when the world is as complex and as unpredictable as it ever was. It has become fashionable to declare that we must prepare our students for an unknown and unpredictable future, as if up to now the future was predictable and known. With the advent of Society 5.0 and the integration of intelligence machines into our daily lives, we might yet find ourselves living in a virtual and programmable matrix. How will we ensure that our students understand themselves, what they value, and discover their purpose? It is not done by memorizing facts. It is done by helping them to understand who they would be so that they can do what they have to do. It is critical that we wake up from our artificial matrix and equip our students to be prepared to navigate the complexities of a human-centered society and to fully embrace the pursuits that they embark upon, helping them to understand who they are, the kind of world they want to live in, 
and to commit to their future with integrity and through meaningful, inter through, through meaningful action will only happen if we return to what I think is the purpose of education, achieving personal mastery to prevail over a seemingly chaotic world and to learn to contribute meaningfully to the society we live in. How to accomplish this is a critical question facing an ailing education system failing most young people today and which does, not, which does appear to be out of touch with the needs of a contemporary and diverse world. The next chapter in my research will be to continue to explore how we might strengthen academic commitment by creating learning experiences that maximize autonomy, encourage commitment in favor of requiring mere compliance, and most of all, create a human-centered learning environment that prioritizes personal meaning and purpose. I thank you. Colleagues and distinguished guests, please join me, uh, join me again in congratulating Professor Human Fuhrer for such an insightful and thought-provoking lecture. Can we put our hands together for her? <laughs> Indeed, I believe that those who are teachers in this hall, Professor Human Fuhrer, when we live here, we will, if we are not doing it from tomorrow, we will start creating meaningful learning experiences for our students. Distinguished guests, allow me to say thank you to all of you who attended this um, inaugural lecture, in particular those who worked tirelessly behind the scenes to ensure the success of this inaugural lecture. Registrar Professor Caroline Nicholson, thank you for your role this evening. Members of the management team in the Faculty of Education, Professor Mampani, head of Department of Education Psychology. Faculty staff in the Dean's Office in particular, uh, Dr. Sharon Mashau, who is the head of marketing in the Faculty of Education. The supplier of academic regalia, Gordon Harris Photography. We, Clute Production for, product, uh, for providing the live streaming services and tax rates for catering services. Thank you all for your contribution, as I said earlier on, for the success of this inaugural lecture. All visitors, friends, and family of Professor Human Fuhrer, in particular, his father, who has already, who has already been acknowledged and is, has been following online, the husband, Dr. Rick, Fuhrel and daughter Ray Fuhrel, thank you for your support to Professor Human Fuhrel that has contributed in her reaching this milestone in her career. Thank you also for your presence this evening. I also want to extend my thanks and gratitude to those who are watching online. And I would like to again invite you once more to congratulate Professor Human Fuhrel on her inaugural lecture. <laughs> to those who are watching the event uh, online, please feel free to leave comments in the chat box on your screen. The proceedings for tonight are officially adjourned, and I would like to invite you to join us outside uh, for refreshments. May the audience stand up and remain standing until the procession leaves the hall. Gaudiamus in